Press on so that we can um, complete the program by lunchtime. So it's all in your hands, and I think we have a quorum at the table. Yes, we do. Right. We have a team. We have a short um, presentation. Yep. Just to introduce the item. Okay, so the, the context here is that the last comprehensive review of how local government is financed and funded in New Zealand was 10 years ago. You may recall the, the Shand Report, the Shand Inquiry. Um, so the government's decided 10 years on, it's time to have another comprehensive review. So they've asked the Productivity Commission to uh, go and lead that review. Um, there was uh, an issues paper that came out earlier this year. The council made a submission, for put some uh, feedback on the issues paper now we're at the stage where a draft report has come out with a series of conclusions and draft recommendations. And uh, what's on the agenda for you today to consider is a draft, um, draft submission uh, on, uh, back to the Productivity Commission on their draft report. Um, so it's important to note that this is just through to the Productivity Commission. Um, it's not government policy. The government will consider the final recommendations uh, from the Productivity Commission in about November this year, and then the government will decide whatever policy changes it, uh, it may want to adopt out of that, and that may then result in a, a legislative change process, uh, depending on what the government wants to do with the conclusions from this report. Um, so the key findings of the report is that a, the current system that's based around property taxes, being rates, uh, is an appropriate system generally for local government. But there are some key areas, some key issues that the local government sector is dealing with where new funding and financing tools are necessary. And we'll step through those shortly. So in preparing the draft submission, we've worked across the council family. We've had input from various CCOs um, and sought feedback from all of the local boards. So all of that is kind of fed into um, the, the submission that's in the papers in front of you. Um, we generally uh, agree with some of the key findings, uh, the key uh, conclusions around funding challenges and some of the responses. There are some other areas we think uh, should be emphasised and we think some of the recommendations are, while good in theory, there are some practical issues with the implementation. So with that I'll pass over to, uh, to Andrew. Good morning. The Commission finds, the Commission's finding the system is working well across New Zealand. We're also asking, however, that they look at Auckland's particular circumstances. We're 33% of New Zealand's population and 50% of its growth. The super city was a, similar to an Australian state. And the super city was established to bring the former councils together to allow us to form a single vision that could be smoothly implemented tackle those challenges. We're progressing that. We now have a single view of whether we want the city to be in the future and the plans to deliver on it. But that now requires us to work across multiple agencies, including government ones, and that's slowing us our ability down to move as fast as we'd like to deliver on those goals. So our submission asks that the Commission consider delegating greater responsibility to the Council with associated additional funding tools, potentially a share of GST or returning some of the GST on rates to the Council to allow us to move faster to deliver on the plans that we've set for the City. So this is an addition to what the Commission has, has focused on in their key findings. <coughs> In regard to their key findings, we'll run through what we see being three of the key ones here. First of all, funding growth infrastructure. We support the Commission's proposal or their recommendations that the Government continue to work on the development of special purpose vehicles to provide access for private sector funding of infrastructure to allow us to accelerate the growth of the city noting that that requires a revenue stream to support the financing. There might be some compulsory levies to deliver on that, similar to targeted rates or DCs. They also have some other recommendations that we support in this space, but we've identified some 
administrative and economic issues with those. And while we're supportive of the general intent, we've got some suggestions as to how they might be better delivered on. The next key recommendation or the key area is in regard to climate change. Alec. Kia ora um, So yeah, in terms of the climate change component of the, the, the report, so broadly speaking, we are generally supportive of the recommendations. Um, they align with previous submissions we've made to the Productivity Commission on a low emissions economy and recent submissions on the zero carbon bill. Um, there are probably two things that I'd flag this committee that we've canvassed at, at workshop. Um, one is a recommendation around the role of New Zealand Transport Agency, extending that role to help co-fund local roads um, that are facing significant threats to climate change from sea level rise and more intense storms and floods. Um, the, the, the point we've made though there in supporting that recommendation is that the funding for that uh, needs to come from new sources that existing funding um, has been allocated, so this actually needs to come from somewhere else. It's not existing funding. Um, the second second thing to raise is the establishment of a, a, a local government resilience fund to help redesign, possibly relocate, rebuild wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. And again, we've supported that, that recommendation. Just a couple of things to note that we've also pushed back on. Um, as you'll see, this talks solely about adaptation to climate change. Um, there is a role around mitigation, so reducing our emissions, and funding and financing around those actions are, are as important as the adaptation side. So we've, we've made that statement and said we need to consider that component as well. Um, and it's worth noting on that front that in previous submissions and work that the government's done themselves, um, a form of blended finance where public and private capital comes together to address that climate, those climate impacts um, have been, has been proposed as, a, as an intervention and needs to be a, um, something that's reinforced through this work. Andrew. That rates for affordabilities stayed pretty stable over time. However, they feel that there are some equity and transparency issues with the rating systems across the country. Our submission and they're making some proposed changes and that they're recommending some changes in that space. Our submission doesn't support those proposed changes. We don't see there being value in removing differentials and the uniform annual general charge completely from all rates. Auckland Council on its amalgamation went through an extensive process to determine the current rating system. It was done very transparently, councillors were actively involved and the community made a big contribution to that decision making. We're also removing differentials, we'll put residential rates up by 22%. The council's submission agrees that benefits should be the primary factor in funding decision making and it is in most of our funding decisions at present but we don't support legislative change to make benefits the primary factor. The Council's got legal obligations under the Local Government Act for the four well-beings to be considered, and many of the services funded by general rates are public or merit goods. And the benefits versus affordability balance for the funding of those activities should be made by elected members and not required to be weighted in the first instance towards benefits. Now, benefits, when I say earlier it was the primary driver, it is for much of our funding decision making. So fees and charges, targeted rates for services to particular properties. <coughs> they also recommend a national rates postponement scheme, and we support that, but the submission doesn't support the removal of the rates rebate scheme. Now, the submission, the Productivity Commission's review is extensive, it covers a lot of matters. We've only highlighted a few of the key ones that are covered in our submission here. The submission itself covers uh, some other matters, and we've gone through with our colleagues across the organisation and the CCOs and answered all of the questions and responded to all of the recommendations. They're included in attachment B to the submission. And attachment C includes all the comments from our local boards that have provided those. We're happy to answer any questions. 
Andrew, um, their recommendations about removing the differentials in UAGC are terribly ideological. I mean, it really is whack the poor and reward the rich. How can they state or believe by having differentials in UAGC that that is inequitable in itself and causes distortion? They make some points about the role of central government versus local government in addressing redistribution, but at the same point, and that that could lead to some coherent, some lack of co coherency in those policies. But they then later on go to point out that, or in another part of the report, identify the fact that there isn't that issue in New Zealand with local government and central government because we have different tax bases and different responsibilities for the delivery of services. I wasn't able to spot a particular underlying economic argument supporting the use of benefits for the public goods services as the primary determinant of decision making. I'm sorry for being... It's so, what are you saying? That it's just <laughs> the ideological background or, or disposition of the panel members then? Anyway, you don't need to answer that. Right. Um, is any further? Ca Councillor Casey. Well, first of all, I'm sorry I missed a workshop. It's not usual. I also missed a date with Andrew to discuss the submission. I'm terribly sorry about that, Andrew. Had I been to either of those, I would have raised this then. And it really relates to paragraphs 46 and 47. They are really confused. First question is, when did we decide that we were going to accelerate the introduction of new types of charging for roads? I know that we're investigating it, but never at any time have we actually taken a vote to accelerate the introduction of it. And, and just on those two paragraphs, there's a real confusion between road pricing and congestion charging that you need to sort out. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't read well at all. So can I leave that one with you? Definitely we haven't, we're not accelerating anything, that, to my knowledge, unless I missed a vote, but I don't usually miss votes either. So you've clumped in road pricing. I'll tell you what it is. Road, road pricing is weasel words for tolling. People understand what tolling is. They don't understand what road pricing is. And if you call road pricing congestion charging, you're actually really muddling people up. Yeah. So I guess what, what we're trying to say here is we're, we're already doing work with central government, looking at the congestion question project, looking at all those, those options. Um, the, the, the comment about acceleration, I guess we're just saying, doing that work faster and progressing it um, is, is advantageous, doing it sooner rather than later. But the, the main purpose was, I, just, I guess, agreeing with the, the concept of this is, this is a useful area to look at and we're already looking at it with central government and we thought it was kind of helpful that the Project Commission is, is, is calling out that the work that's already underway is, um, is worthwhile. It's good, Ross, but that's not what that says. It so says we support the accelerate, accelerating the introduction of new types of charges. We, we're not. We're, we're just. We're accelerating yep. the work. Yep. The so investigatory work. That's yep. all. So we're happy to work on the word in there to yep. get that clear. Okay, I could help you with it. Okay. <laughs> so accelerating the work on the investigation of whatever, because remember the regional fuel tax. It really was. It is supposed to be an interim measure to hopefully other measures that are, are more. And remember, we were replacing that inequitable transport targeted rate as well, <laughs> Councillor Casey. <laughs> right, we have Councillor Newman. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, look, I think the submission is quite good. A couple of comments and questions from me. Um, with respect to the proposed removal of the uniform annual general charge. Actually, I like that idea. I like the removal of the uniform annual general charge because I think that uh, it's uh, appropriate to uh, allocate the cost where it should lie. Uh, and I don't really support the idea of, of the poorest people in our community uh, cross-subsidising those who are, who are some of the wealthiest. Um, but I, I acknowledge that the submission is, is nuanced in a way to reflect what I think is the current position of the people around this table. The second question is, um, 
it, you, you've got to be very careful about taxing undeveloped land because, frankly, if you were to develop that land, um, a lot of the transmission infrastructure that should be provided by the council isn't ready. Uh, the question with respect to the special purpose vehicles, I mean, I think there is a tremendous degree of controversy that would arise from giving coercive taxing and rating powers to unelected bodies um, that don't have a democratic recourse. Um, so I, I acknowledge that the SPV model is fraught. I'm just wondering what work is may currently be taking place in relation to the special purpose vehicle with respect to the central interceptor because there's been some work that the council's been involved in previously in this space, but we've gone rather quiet on that at the moment. So is someone able to comment on that? Ross. Um, so we're not currently um, progressing work on that space. Um, a lot of the early work on the SPV model, Central Interceptor, was one project which we had lots of information about. It was a significant scale. It was a, you know, a useful um, project to, to, to do the analysis on but um, I'm not aware of current work that's specifically focusing on central intercept as a, as a priority. So that earlier work, what happened to that? Did we just decide that it was just going to be too hard or we'll, we'll kick it for touch and kick the can down the road and try and reignite this in the future? I think the focus has shifted to the model, um, how might the model work, how to... How to uh, all the details around that, how do rating agencies see the model, how might, um, what legislation might be required. So the focus has gone less on a particular project and more on the, the model, uh, the structure, and, and how the SP model, SPV model can work. Yeah. So we're no longer considering the central interceptor as an option for an SPV? It's not currently being progressed, but no one's made any decisions to rule anything in, in or out. Uh, who holds the pen on, on options for that one? Is that sit with you? Where does that go? Who holds the pen? I guess that's, there's, there's a whole, there'd be a whole decision-making process at, at the moment. It's very early stages, and as I said, all the work is focusing on the model um, that would enable um, any particular project to go through an SPV-type type approach. But Ross, I, I think you can say, verify that the pen has been held by Wellington at the moment. The, the, Wellington is you know, leading the work on legislative change and all that kind of thing. In terms of who would make a final decision on a project, that would depend on how the legislative, pro, legislative process is set up. Um, but, but I imagine in practice, the they would, you know, central government would need to talk to the council and to Watercare and if, uh, if there was you know, strong disagreement, it might be very difficult to get anything happening. Are we currently involved in any discussions with Treasury around the SPV model for funding projects, big capital projects in Auckland? So I, I wouldn't mind responding. So, so through the Chair, and I think we've discussed this before, um, uh, one of the most important points that Ross is making is that any of this and all of this would require legislative change. Legislative change is the domain of central government. That will be driven and is being driven by advice from Treasury and DIA. And yes, we have some involvement in and around that because Treasury and DIA are needing to and wanting to consult with officials in their sector along the way. So I think we would all appreciate that there's a lot to do to credibly have the option of putting any significant project or program through this different format uh, and that work program is being driven by Wellington at the moment. I raise the question, Chair, because I think it is a very germane issue to some of the discussion that we have, which is really a bit teased out in this Productivity Commission report. Uh, what is the work that is taking place with tre Treasury and DIA that Auckland Council is involved in in relation to how a model for an SPV would work so as to inform decision making around legislation to enable it. Because if we were to, I mean, uh, if you were to uh, provide a funding stream with certain with certainty and security for an SPV, it requires, in order to access that third party capital, which is generally a line of credit, uh, coercive taxing powers going to somebody not necessarily uh, a democratically elected body. So if that's the sort of thing that would be discussed as an SPV, 
uh, our role in providing advice and options and looking at the analysis of different projects around that is quite important. Um, so we can. I'd like to happy for this submission to be adopted, but I would like some information as to what we've been doing with Treasury and DIA over the last 12 months on that particular discussion, because that will be um, a matter that will need to be socialised with our community, because I don't actually think that our community necessarily would support um, parking off, parking bits and pieces of projects um, to an entity that doesn't have any recourse like we as councillors do for the decisions that we make. So Matthew, I'll take that up offline with you, um, but happy for the submission to progress, not the stand the fact that I don't agree with all parts of it, but if the government was to be so brave to move on UAGC that I'm very happy to my, write my submission in favour of that. But you agree, yeah, you're happy with this submission, which is clearly saying we wish to look into it because we prefer, for example, possibly yes, uh, PVs over vacant land taxes or unoccupied land taxes, because you indicated you didn't ap approve those either. Yeah? No, no, I'm just clarifying, so the staff are listening. <laughs> Councillor Darby. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> just on, oh, I want to acknowledge, the Alec, your work on this, on making sure that climate change is more than adequately recognised and responded to. That's excellent work. Uh, on the vacant land tax, I I've been thinking in this area too, um, and this does pose a question though, doesn't it? Because you can have entirely vacant land, but then you can have undeveloped land. You could have somebody that's one of our seniors that's got a nice three, four bedroom house on a thousand metres but the zoning says that you could put three houses on it. So what's the difference between having some vacant land and possibly taxing that, and then not realising the development potential as per your zoning? And I think that's, that could be quite onerous on people if it went into that sort of direction. So, and I'm, I'm struggling to see what, what the difference is, actually. Um, so I'm wondering if we could just explain our submission point there, because I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. I, I can understand the desire to not have people banking land, but people don't necessarily you know, realise the development potential of other, many, many other properties, and I wouldn't like to see people uh, bundled into that same category. Maybe some explanation. The Commission's proposal is about vacant land, not about underdeveloped land, although where you draw, as you point out, it's, there isn't necessarily a neat line you can draw between those two broad categories. So while we like the idea of encouraging people to appropriately develop vacant land, the submission identifies at that level some of the challenges associated with doing that and notes that those sorts of incentive charges may work better in the SPV context where you are putting infrastructure in and then thinking about the best way to fund that, including having an incentive element within that funding. And the submission notes one of the balances in relation to that incentive impact is having a politically acceptable charge. Just take an example, I'm trying to think of an example. Let's say we've got a farmer, he's on the edge and his new zoning uh, is country style living and suddenly he can put eight development blocks on his land or 10 or more. Um, so is he likely, or she, sorry, that's sexist, isn't it? Um, is that owner, likely to be captured by that requirement to pay a vacant land tax? Because they're farming, but it's a country-style living zone, and there's expectation that the development for it to not be vacant land is something different to farming. That's the challenge with a tax of that nature, is deciding exactly where you strike it and for what reasons. 
one of the reasons why the submission focuses more on the SPV vehicle and the investments, thinking that while the vacant land tax has got some principal merits behind it, there are some challenges and that just reflects another one of the difficulties that could arise in looking to apply that. There isn't necessarily a neat answer to that and that would have to be a judgement exercised by whoever was making the decisions at the time. So just on that point, Mr Chair, I think there's some implications. So we need to, in our submission, we need to fully understand the implications of that particular part. Um, the other area is, did, did we take the opportunity to reinforce um, again um, how Crown is off the hook on its non-rateable lands in Auckland? That was raised a little uh, in our earlier submission, but it hasn't been a focus of this one, which is mainly focused on the recommendations that they've made. Um, but of course, our original submission is still on the table with the Commission. Chair, I, th I think this is an ongoing issue. We just can't miss the beat on continuing to raise the impost that non rateable Crown land has on all other ratepayers uh, and the citizens of Auckland. Just, just as an example, for example, where we've got $47 million allocated for project in my area, the, the Lake Road project. A significant beneficiary of that is the Defence Force at the Devonport Navy base. But they won't be coughing up much, if at all, towards that project because uh, they are major traffic generators, AM and PM peak, but it's Crown land and they don't contribute. Now, we've, we could probably each raise numerous examples like that. So I would like us to keep uh, reiterating that, that this council does want government to address the non rateability of Crown land where it has a significant impost on the uh, infrastructure constraints and demands of the city. Comment team. Um, certainly, on the one hand, we talk about rates as a tax, and if you're looking at that context, there might be some logic in the Crown not paying, because we argue there shouldn't be a tax on our tax. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at it as a service, as rates as a, in a service sense, then having all the government agencies make a contribution towards those services in, in the same way that they would do to any other services they purchase has got some logic. Certainly, there is scope within our report to, uh, within the draft submission, to add that commentary, or at least commentary about the Crown's non rateability back in. Well, I would endorse what Councillor Darby is saying. I mean, the bottom line is we've put a whole lot in there about GST, but we've got really no chance at all getting any GST back. It's pretty pretty blatant. Both both parties are pretty clear on that one. So I, the non-rateable land is uh, maybe a way of just getting some money back from the government. Can I just and I know the Mayor wants to say Just before the Mayor so. speaks on this, because I know this is something on top of mind for the Mayor as well, and we've been talking about it. Maybe there's a more nuanced... We're sort of just going back and saying we should... It's, it's a very sort of catch-all response. Maybe we should start examining this in a more nuanced way. Maybe when our finance and rates team need to look at that crown non-rateable and, and look at... Sort of chunk it up and look at um, what we really want to home in on the, in the first instance. Maybe we need to knock this off over... 10 years rather than try to do it in a one-hit wonder. Because <laughs> uh, there's a complexity to the um, non-rateability. I don't really want to see education, for example, um, maybe in that category. You know, others <laughs> might have various other, okay. other views, but there's some, there's some areas where there's definitely tremendous impost on our ratepayers and we should be homing in on it. As you bring up education, because at least that's equitable across the country. They don't pay rates anywhere. So, so it's not as though we're being a, 
uh, Meg off, I know you want to say something. Yeah, um, look, I, I think it comes under the umbrella of revenue sharing by central government to local government, and we've got a number of different mechanisms by which we can do that. Um, a tidy one is simply to say, return the, the GST that you charge on top of the rates. An equally tidy one would be to say, well, you know, you're using the land, you're using the services, um, then maybe you should pay the rates on government property in our city and every other city, and that would be a way of revenue sharing. Or you might move directly to the Australian model where federal government revenue shares a percentage of GST down to state government to provide infrastructure. They're all different paths to the same end, which is revenue sharing. Um, and to answer your your, your challenge, Mr Chairman, is the government about to say, yeah, we'll do that? Um, no, of course they're not, because they don't want to share their revenue with local government. Uh, does that mean we should stop asking? And the answer is absolutely not. There, there, is, there are precedents all over the world where governments revenue share with lower levels of government, and we, we got the figure um, from David Norman at the workshop, where 93% of public revenue in this country is taken by government, and 7% by local government. So you have the umbrella, which is the principle of revenue sharing, saying you're pulling, you're pulling in all of this revenue. As Auckland grows, you get more GST, you get, you, you get more income tax, but by the way, Auckland has to meet a lot of the infrastructure charges of making that growth possible. So I think you do it within that context of a growing city, say there needs to be acceptance of the, the principle of revenue sharing, and here's three ways that you could do it. And the fact that they, they won't want to do that immediately should not slow us down. If we can get from the Productivity Commission some endorsement of that principle, just as we have from uh, the New Zealand Initiative, then you build up some momentum. Uh, will we achieve it overnight? Of course we won't. Will we achieve it if we never ask for it? Absolutely we won't achieve it. So we just need to push the concept and then some examples of how we might do that. And, and I would put in, as Councillor Darby has said, um, the concept of uh, government paying rates on its property. And I wouldn't necessarily differentiate whether it's education or defence. It gets very complicated. No, no. Just the principle that they pay revenue uh, and that's a way of devolution of some funding to local government to meet our responsibilities. I wasn't saying for a minute that we wouldn't be pursuing the GST one as we normally do, but I, I'm totally endorsing the idea of putting in um, government property as, as another um, another uh, angle of, of attack or whatever. I mean, because the irony is you're talking about we pay local government effectively get 7%, but we get it in the neck, neck big time, and especially the people around this table, because local boards, oh, it's, they, make, they set the rates, the councillors, we don't. <laughs> Of course, basically, we get it in the neck as councils and mayors, councillors and mayors. So I have Councillor Lee, and that could be wrapping it up. Thank you very much. I'll just go through this page by page um, briefly. Um, just a small point. In paragraph five, we are, um, we're talking about the scale of Auckland, and there's a, there's a typo. Um, Auckland's premier city. Uh, I, I, I say this every time there's a, a, a submission that goes to Wellington, that these submissions are going to be viewed by people who don't live in Auckland, and many of them resent what they consider to be Auckland boasting or big noting. So I, I, I would downplay all that premier uh, stuff. We are the biggest city. That's That's... Um, reason enough, I think. Um, the the other point that I'm concerned about is uh, particularly is the um, special purpose vehicle, which clearly a lot of work is going on behind the scenes. Um, that as an elected member, I, I I don't have much information about, but I I have two problems with a special purpose vehicle, so called. One of them is that just adding in supply is not going to solve our cost problem in Auckland. There, there we are dealing uh, in a, a situation of encouraged growth. Some of the highest, the city is one of the highest growing cities in the OECD, and that is not an accident. It's been encouraged both by the council and, of course, the government of the day. Um, so 
on top of that, we also have an environment rather unique to New Zealand by the look of it, where construction material and everything associated with that is at an elevated cost because of a constrained or duopoly market. And it seems to me the more money the public sector has in this market, um, the prices will increase to meet that. That's the commercial reality. And, and the Productivity Commission doesn't seem to be that particularly interested in, in that bigger picture. And to be honest with you, in regard to the Productivity Commission, it was one of the policies of the ACT Party. And so um, it tends to view things through a, a quite a hardline neoliberal lens. The other um, points I would make is the, again, you use the term super city. Most, most people refer to the super city in inverted commas nowadays after, after uh, uh, nine years. In terms of the vacant land tax, it's not clear what vacant means. Are we saying that um, agriculture or um, farms or trees or natural areas means vacant? Um, because that puts a bias against nature. And if we're really worried about climate change and we have to be concerned about sustainable management, because that's in the legislation, um, th the assumptions around a vacant land tax appear to be uh, more growth, more development, and forget about the environmental costs, and most importantly, forget about the costs of infrastructure. And then we go around in a circle again, oh, how are we going to pay for that infrastructure? So um, sometimes the Productivity Commission has some worthwhile I uh, ideas, but mainly it doesn't. And what I'm concerned about is not so much the Productivity Commission or who takes any notice of it, but what happens inside this council. And I think, um, Oh, yeah, the bed tax. We support the bed tax, but how equitable is that when some parts of the region have to pay the full whack and others get a free pass, apparently for political reasons? That's not particularly equitable or, or, or rigorous. And so, but coming back to the special purpose vehicle, that means if you take that to its logical conclusions, rather than having a so-called super city, or unified, a unitary council, you're going to have yet, in effect, another quasi-local government, except it will be even less accountable than the present system, where ratepayers have to uh, send a bill from some organisation, which probably sends out a PR leaflet as well, but there'll be no accountability uh, to those ratepayers. And I think that that is a, apart from lack of financial discipline, in other words, here's some more money, folks, we can all keep on spending, uh, that will be to the detriment of democracy. The, the one thing I do is this, agree... So is, we're on question time, Councillor Lee. Is there a question? Sorry? Uh, I'm making a statement. OK, right. OK. okay. The one thing I do well, agree, uh, agree on, um, Mr Chairman, is in terms of equity on tax, the GST one is certainly something that we should, on principle, um, be arguing for our... Um, there shouldn't be a tax on a tax. In other words, GST on rates for a start. Um, that's the first step. The other one is um, the, the, the equity of, of where that is spent. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's, that's just my comments. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Simpson. I'll be brief, Mr Chairman. Thank you. I support the proposal. I also support um, examples of how we could go about suggesting to the government um, that uh, answers on the non-rateable uh, land. Um, but I also think if we're going to do that, we should put in an example of actually what we're missing out of as a result of their policy around this. So, for example, we should put in the figures of uh, the GST on rates. What what potentially that would mean for us. And we should put in examples of the non-rateable property, if it was rateable, 
what that could possibly look like. And I just think you need, we need to perhaps clearly articulate the quantum of um, the potential income if we haven't already. Thanks. Councillor Young. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I do support this uh, submission, but I'm asking the, what kind of range are for possible capital investment by SPU? The range investment from overseas. Do we discussing or they just propose? Thank you. Sorry, the, the range, you mean in, in terms of amount, dollar, yes. dollar size? Um, so um, so if, if the model can be, can, can, can work as intended and it can be a model that enables investment without relying on the council balance sheet and ideally if it doesn't rely on the crown balance sheet then it's, it's only limited by the supply of private, uh, private capital that wants to invest in Auckland and in New Zealand. Um, we know there's a whole lot of capital out there so, so there is, I guess there is no fixed limit on, on that capital. We can see that once you unlock the model um, there is there is no limit on on the ability there ability to get capital in. Um, there is still the requirement that you know whatever capital is raised needs to be repaid by the beneficiaries of the infrastructure over time. So the limiting factor just becomes well, what is the revenue source that will ultimately repay that debt? So so I guess that's yeah we don't we don't see it as being a, a finite limit in the same way that council debt is limited. All right. Okay, right. Well, we've got a mover and a seconder, and we seem to be in general agreement. Are we? Oh, yep. Yeah, Councillor Young is. Yeah. Oh, good. Moved and seconded. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Right. Now, um, I think we will go for lunch because it could be that we're going to have a bit of time over some of the other items. So. But we shouldn't be long after lunch, so please, one thirty, one thirty. Thank you.